Well, welcome to all our guests who have arrived now. Um, a few instructions, if you haven't already, please mute yourselves and take your video off, as well as uh, put your screen in speaker view by going to the right-hand corner and going to view and selecting speaker view, side-by-side -side speaker. And now I will introduce Professor Emeritus Robert Cherney, who will be introducing uh, Ivy Anderson and Devin Angus on their published work, Alice Memoirs of a Barbary Coast Prostitute. We thank you so much for joining us today. And as always, you can make a contribution to the Presidio Historical Association at pha-sf.org. Enjoy the, uh, the talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Am I muted? I think I have to unmute. You're good. You can hear me? We all can hear you, Bob, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I was asked to make this introduction because Devin Angus was a member of my last graduate seminar at San Francisco State in the spring of 2012. I then retired from teaching uh, after that semester. It was a research seminar focused on San Francisco in the early 20th century. And Devin did a paper on Fremont Older, who was the maverick editor of the Bulletin and later the Call, two of the city's, I think four at that time, maybe five daily newspapers. Devin's paper earned an A. And he's told me that it was his research on Fremont Older that later led him to the topic of today's talk. Uh, Devin also told me that he met Ivy Anderson while they were both at San Francisco State where she earned her BA in environmental studies. Uh, they described themselves as historians, writers, artists, and activists, and have said that they seek to clarify current political and cultural crises by illuminating overlooked histories from the American past. Their work examines legacies of feminism, poor people's movements, queer life, criminality, urban politics, and ecological history focused on California and the Bay Area. Their book, which they're going to be talking about, Alice, Memoirs of a Barbary Coast Prostitute, won the California Historical Society Book Award in 2015. And you'll certainly be hearing more about that book and how that book came to be. They have been, or will soon be, writers in residence at three places, the U-Cross Foundation in Wyoming, the Art Farm in Nebraska, and the Prelinger Library in San Francisco. They're currently working on a second book, which examines a prison revolt that took place at San Quentin in 1911. And if you came in a little bit early, you may have heard that they're also collaborating on screenwriting. So that's enough for me, let's hear from them. Thank you so much, Bob, and uh, thank you, Samantha, and everybody at the PHA who made this talk possible. We're so grateful to get to spend our Sunday afternoon um, talking with you all about this research that really just has um, transformed our lives as well as our perspective on the city of San Francisco, you know, which we call home and have for quite a long time and and adore, uh, and so you know, hopefully you all will be inspired by what we have to share with you today as well. Uh, all right, so to begin, um, what, what was A Voice from the Underworld? What is this that we're talking about today? Um, a Voice from the Underworld was the serialized memoir of a sex worker uh, who lived in San Francisco in 1913. Her story was published in daily installments, six days a week in the San Francisco Bulletin, which was one of the sort of top three daily papers in San Francisco at the time. Uh, and her story ran between June 23rd and August 12th, 1913. Now, what's unique about this narrative, uh, because this was, this was a period in American history where these sort of 
prostitute memoirs that fell under the fell under the aegis of sort of white slave narratives were a media sensation that had plastered the pages of newspapers um, nationwide for uh, since about 1885, particularly between 1890 and 1910. Um, but Alice's story really challenges stereotypes about sex workers that were perpetuated by this sort of white slave narrative. And we'll get into that a little bit later in our talk. Um, but primarily, Alice presents herself as neither a victim nor a wholly free agent um, and portrays herself really as a working class woman who is making the most of limited economic choices that stood before her. Now this story had a huge splash at the time in San Francisco. Um, the newspaper's circulation increased by 30,000 within the first month of the serial appearing on the pages of the paper. And if we are to believe Fremont Older, the editor of the bulletin, uh, 4,300 letter writers wrote letters to the editor in response to this story. Uh, 300 of those letters were published in daily installments side by side with the serial. As you can see um, on the screen here, there's the girlhood memories awakened by name, followers of nightlife and others cry out against evil. These are examples of the letters that were published alongside Alice's story. Um, of which there were 300. Uh, 114 of those 300 published letters were written by self-proclaimed sex workers sharing their reactions to this story and also intimate bits about their own lives. Uh, another 30 of those letters were written by destitute and working class women who had at one point or another in their lives considered sex work. Um, Letters were also written by clergymen, club women, politicians, married women, grandmothers, Johns. And fascinatingly, there was sort of a proto Me Too movement happening uh, on the pages of this paper in 1913, where inspired by Alice's story, uh, dozens of women of all classes wrote in discussing their experiences of gender inequality, sexual repression, um, as well as sexual assault and how that had impacted their lives. And then suddenly, mid-August, August 12th, the story, the serial ends very abruptly and wrapped up a little too tidily in mine and Devin's opinion in what we now know was an act of intentional censorship, uh, which we will also elaborate on in detail later on in our talk here. So um, in the spring of 2013, pretty much exactly 100 years after the publication of Alice's story, Devin and I tracked down this serial um, by spending a few days in the microfilm archive at the San Francisco Main Library, uh, scrolling through daily installments of the bulletin from 1910 on until finally stumbling upon this narrative. Uh, in all the secondary source literature that we had studied, it seems as though A Voice from the Underworld had really gone unexamined since 1913. But after reading the letters and Alice's story, we couldn't imagine why. It seemed like such a remarkable document, especially considering the paucity of resources that historians have from this era into working class women and sex workers describing the conditions of their own lives. Uh, so immediately upon discovering this document, we knew that we needed to know more. Who was Alice? Why did the bulletin publish her story? Was it a genuine sex worker narrative? Or was it another one of these fake prostitute memoirs used to stir up controversy and make a buck? Uh, what impact, if any, did her story have on local politics? And what happened to Alice and the letter writers when the brothels of San Francisco's red light district, the Barbary Coast, finally closed in 1917? So we're excited to share with you today what we found. I will kind of go back and forth to give you an overview of the context in which this story was published, the content of the story, and some of the letters that were written in, and then talk about the impact of Alice's narrative on San Franciscans at the time and sort of the legacy of sex worker organizing in San Francisco since 1913. Um, 
so it was important for us to determine why this was a uh, trustworthy memoir. Um, of course, this term trustworthy is a little odd. What, uh, where did it come from? Why hadn't it been looked at? And um, why hadn't historians uh, either found it or, or, or taken it seriously? And we haven't really had a lot of answers really um, at, at this time. Um, and one of the reasons for this is, is, is this era. I spoke about um, these those white slave narratives that were all over papers all over America for some time. Um, and uh, historians have, have tended to uh, not believe the vast, vast majority of these memoirs. It's actually very unusual that you could find something that could be considered to be in a uh, legitimate memoir um, from a sex worker that hasn't been adulterated in some way. Um, and often these white slave narratives came out of a uh, reform, social cleanup, vigilante sort of uh, philosophy. Um, the San Francisco Bulletin was a reform, vigilante, uh, social cleanup sort of paper. It goes all the way back to um, the to the 1850s and the Vigilance Committee of 1856 is really where the, the paper was born. And uh, Fremont Older, its editor, who took the reins in 1895, uh, kept this going. Um, what we really found, originally what I found in uh, class with Bob Cherney in 2012, and then later as we looked in this, is that there's really two kind of ways to look at the paper and its editor, Fremont Older. Um, on the one hand, uh, Fremont Older was uh, seen as a, as a radical. Uh, Emma Goldman thought that the San Francisco Bulletin was uh, the famous anarchist writer and, uh, and activist Emma Goldman, uh, thought that it was one of the only trustworthy capitalist papers uh, in terms of her politics. Other folks saw Fremont Older as a disciple of Hearst and the yellow journalism that was rife during the era and that the Bulletin was, the, was, was, was amongst the worst of them all. Um, there's a, a, a book, Prairie Fires, The American Dreams of Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, whose daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, got her first writing work with the Bulletin. And in her Pulitzer Prize winning book, she, uh, she has a, this very cartoonish sort of a caricature of Freeman Alder, uh, if I could quote it here. Uh, she says that San Francisco was the Western headquarters of yellow journalism. The Bulletin was no exception. And older, its editor, a character straight out of Mark Twain with a handlebar mustache and a cigar clamped in his mouth, was Hearst's disciple. Under older, the bulletin exhibited all the sensational qualities of the golden age of yellow journalism, lurid eye-popping headlines, splashy, splashy photographs, and creative use of typefaces. Its inventive reporting refused to be chastened by fact. So, uh, Carolyn Frazier winning the Pulitzer Prize, okay, you know, and uh, we, we beg to differ though, because uh, if you look through her bibliography, if you look through um, her end notes, she never once went to the Bancroft Library and looked at the sizable Fremont Older archives, which we've uh, gone through every piece of paper in. And uh, when you start looking at Fremont Older from the standpoint, you can start seeing a very, very different picture. Um, there's a lot of reasons why Fremont Older has been considered in this other way. Um, we don't really have time to so, so much go into that, but one important thing about the publication of Alice Smith's memoir, um, which was titled A Voice from the Underworld in the Bulletin, um, is to understand a certain almost religious conversion that happened with Fremont Older and uh, after he was a longtime atheist, so it's, let's call it a philosophical conversion um, that happened where he, he, he really steered the newspaper, which had been something like a, a, a prosecutor trying to go after people on his crusades and put them in prison and to punish them. That was what this kind of role, and this is what you can see as kind of a vigilante role of this newspaper. And then all of a sudden, this event that happens changes him, and he changes the paper into something much more like a, uh, a, a public defender and a defender of people that, that, uh, that have uh, no voice or have little rights in society. And um, 
So it's important for us to talk about the memoir, to, to look a little bit at this conversion. So I'm gonna speak about it uh, for a, a short period of time here. Um, so Fremont Older, taking the reins in 1895, uh, soon becomes wrapped up in something called, you know, the graft hunt, the graft trials of the first decade of the 20th century, which was, it's kind of a complex thing. We don't want to go too much into it, but the idea was that uh, the, the political boss of the Union Labor Party, which was in power, uh, was seen by several people, including Older, as, as this linchpin of corruption and that you had to get rid of this, that the, here's this era of reform, and this is, you have to get rid of this, this man. His, his name was Abraham Roof. And so for a decade, uh, Freeman Older and, and several other people, he was one of, of uh, it, was a, it, 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 it rose up to, to the federal level of trying to go after uh, these folks, and, and primarily Abraham Roof. Um, a lot of this also involved powerful business interests in the city, uh, after all the dust settled, one person was sent to uh, prison uh, for any any long period of time, which was this man, this political boss, Abraham Roof. And for the most part, a lot of the people that Fremont Older and his graft, fellow graft hunters went after uh, weren't punished. And this is something that bothered Fremont Older. And it confused, this. what happened confused people at the time, and it seems to have confused historians as well, he immediately, he visits Abraham Roof, older, goes to San Quentin, visits him, and is absolutely shocked by the conditions of the prison. And he's absolutely shocked by his emotional reaction to seeing this man that he spent 10 years to try to put, to put into prison. Um, and uh, he then goes on to this long campaign. Excuse me. Uh-oh, uh-oh, lost the earpiece. Excuse me. Uh, he goes on this long campaign to try to get this man who he just helped put in prison out of prison. And um, really, I, I want to go through his own words. He, he wrote, I think, very eloquently his reasoning for wanting to get Abraham Roof out of prison. And this, this conversion, this philosophical change that he speaks about directly then uh, informs this, uh, this mission that he has for the Bulletin to publish memoirs of people that ha don't have a voice. And, and this is something that uh, becomes a quasi-religious and a, uh, something that's the, that, that was considered to be a, 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 a truly revolutionary act um, for him and for the paper. So this is what he says about um, his, his, his change of view towards Abraham Roof. I have asked for mercy to Ruth because I felt that I, above all others, had done most to bring about his downfall. If you have followed the long fight the Bulletin has made during the past eight or nine years, you will recall that I was fighting Ruth long before the city woke up. You will also recall that I attacked him bitterly with all of the invective that I could personally command and all that I could hire. At last, after eight years of man hunting and man hating debauch, Roof crossed over and became what I wanted him to be, a convict, stripped of his citizenship, stripped of everything society values, except the remnant of an ill-gotten fortune. It is then I said to myself, I have got him. He's in stripes. He is in a cell. His head is shaved. He is in tears. He is helpless, beaten, chained killed so far as his old life is concerned. You have won. How do you like your victory? My soul revolted. I thought over my own life and the many unworthy things I had done to others, the injustice, the wrongs I had been guilty of, the human hearts I had wantonly hurt, the sorrows I had caused, the half-truths I had told, and the mitigating truths I had withheld, the lies I had allowed to go undenied. And then I saw myself also stripped that is stripped of all pretense, shame, self-righteousness, holding the key to another man's cell. I dropped the key. I never want to hold it again. Let it be taken up and held by those who feel they are justified in holding it. I want no more jail keys. For the rest of my life, I want to get a little nearer to the forgiving spirit that Christ expressed. Isn't what I'm accusing myself of true of all of us? Going over to San Quentin with this with this uh, idea, um, he Fremont Older uh, shifted to a extreme uh, passion for 
convict rights and ex-convict rights for prison reform. And uh, really, it gets starts getting into what we're talking about nowadays with the ideas of prison abolition. And he felt, Freeman Older felt, that Abraham Roof could write for the paper and tell his side of the story. He also felt like convicts and ex-convicts could write their stories for the paper. And here are stories that, that you're not going to be necessarily hearing. He, want, he thought that if you heard first-person accounts, because an interesting thing about the paper, about Freeman Older in the paper is that he wasn't an, a, a dictator. Or he didn't have a monolithic sort of view. He, uh, it's often people that work for the paper said that he liked to have all sorts of different viewpoints for the paper. And it can be a little confusing to read it if you're looking for sort of a thesis of the paper, because it certainly really wasn't there. And uh, Freeman Older realized that Abraham Roof taught him something. And as he spoke with these ex-convicts and convicts, he realized that he didn't really realize what was going on. He didn't understand what was going on on the ground. And, and he allowed these memoirs and these stories to change and affect himself, just like he was hoping the, 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 the viewers would be changed, and that he grew. And, and, and this is exactly what you see with A Voice from the Underworld and Al Smith's story. Uh, before that, the paper wasn't terribly different. They, it still, it was, it was very concerned with cleaning up the Barbary Coasts, very concerned with you know, the victimhood of, of sex workers, and and uh, and it had a lot of uh, prejudices that it the that the paper learned to get over through working with Alice Smith. Yeah. Um, central to to central to all of this is uh, a, a figure by the name of Donald Lowry. He was a prisoner at, um, at San Quentin that Fremont Older met. And uh, Donald Lowry also um, introduced a man named Jack Black, who was also a convict at San Quentin and Folsom, several places uh, for a long time. Um, and these two men both wrote memoirs of their experiences in prison that uh, were, 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 were uh, very seriously uh, they, they were read all over the country. They uh, started prison reform movements, uh, uh, most notably in Sing Sing and attempted at San Quentin. Um, now, Donald Lowry's, uh, he published a book that was serialized called My Life in Prison. And this, this serial was um, interesting in that it had to be defended. And this happens with A Voice from the Underworld. It had to be defended because a lot of readers didn't believe that a convict could have written this. Um, it, it felt adulterated. It felt like uh, some of this yellow journalism, some, some, some line. I'd actually like to read a little bit of what Don Lowry said. Uh, he published another serial a few years later called My Life Out of Prison about his experiences with Fremont Older and uh, his life uh, on the outside. Um, so Don Lowry wrote, Presently, the editors of the bulletin began to receive letters expressing doubt as to the existence of Donald Lowry. No higher tribute to my cause could possibly have been paid. I did not take it as a personal tribute because I felt and still feel that no human being should take credit for expressing thought. Thought is universal and we are all merely vehicles of interpretation. Some express thought well in speaking, some in writing, some in acting, some in laying bricks or digging trenches. All are equally valuable and important. But many of the letters stated that an ex-convict couldn't write that way. And this bore out my belief that numbers of persons were living under the delusion that convicts and ex-convicts are inherently different from other persons and that they cannot manifest intelligently. And this really goes to the crux of what this attempt. This is an era of eugenics. This is an era where the idea of criminality um, the idea of any sort of criminality, or, or, uh, whether it's being a sex worker, or whether it's being a convict or an ex-convict, that this is something that comes congenitally. It's com it comes from something deep within one's uh, physiology, and it's something that really couldn't be corrected. Uh, now, of course, there are different views of whether it could be corrected or not, but but these these the, these internal ideas that, that, that there was something innately wrong with people was was obviously quite common. And, um, and this was one of the things that the paper tried to uh, attack. Out of the publication of, of uh, My Life in Prison, Fremont Older and Donald Lowry started a 
Mutual Aid and Employment Bureau in 1912, which aided uh, ex-convicts. Fremont Older was quite close with the governor, who he actually uh, worked with this graft hunt in San Francisco, Hiram Johnson. And uh, he started asking for parole with different cases that were coming to him. Uh, he also bought some land with his wife, Cora Older, and hoped to start it as a commune with, with various people. Uh, and this is in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, near Saratoga. It's still there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. The Fremont Older uh, Nature Preserve is what it's called now. And uh, this was a place where uh, he had convicts come and live to rehabilitate, uh, to help him work. He, he paid them to, to work on the house, to build. Um, uh, and uh, some people called it Convict Canyon or Convict Gulch. Uh, once again, not really trusting the motives, but if you see letter after letter of people um, expressing this great deal of uh, love and, um, and, and home, uh, some people lived there for decades. Jack Black, who was another one of these uh, memoir writers who later became quite famous and was a big influence on the beatniks, um, he wrote uh, a little bit about uh, Wood Hills, if I could quote him here. He said, when I came back from the year in Quinton, my mind was gone. I went to you and then to your country place for six months. It is the only six months of my life I would care to live over again. Mrs. Older, little Mary, and yourself ease me away from the last bitter thought. Policemen, prosecutors, judges, and jurors are reading your stories. Tell them the time to start helping the so-called criminal is when he is arrested not when he is released. They will never get anything so long as the cop clubs them with his nightstick and turns them into a judge who finishes with a job by giving them five, 10, or 20 years in prison. They are all wrong and they are making it worse. The crime thing is just a boil on the social body. I think it can be corrected. They will never do it by opening it with a poisoned lancet. Point out to them the value of prohibition of paroles and of kindness and helpfulness to the fellow with the bow leg in mind. Um, so this idea of, of, of these memoirs and of this communal nature and of these, of, of these ideas of, of uh, these convicts and ex-convicts helping Fremont Oler to understand the world as opposed to him going after and, and putting his vision out was um, was was a staging ground for uh, this red light abatement fight and for uh, the idea of well perhaps sex workers maybe we have this wrong I mean have we really really talked to sex workers about what you know what's happening and uh, and so the idea of having a memoir that could be published in a similar way to my life in prison Donald Lowry's memoir was what was uh, necessary and. Uh, and Fremont Older turned to Donald Lowry. Donald Lowry uh, interviewed the woman that they called Alice Smith, um, who we later found out had a fifth grade education. And um, they had a ghostwriter, Ernest Hopkins, who wrote out of a series of interviews that we know, the only person who we actually knew that did the interviews is Donald Lowry. We imagine that there were some other people. So here we have this direct connection that goes and, and flows uh, for, from uh, as these memoirs, as this idea of social change. Um, as a final note, it's interesting that uh, Lincoln Steffens, the, the, the great uh, um, activist and, and writer, uh, who was a good friend of Freeman Older, later in, in 1929 asked Freeman Older, he said, you know, these memoirs uh, really did change things. And he, he, he wished that Freeman Older could do that with the labor movement. Um, and then also Carl Sandburg in the 1920s wrote to Fremont Older as well, uh, you know, the great poet, and said, uh, for, uh, for, you know, Fremont, I think that that these memoirs that you've done are are essential uh, re reading for all Americans. He he said that they belonged within about 20 books that should be in every single American library. Um, but surprisingly. After a certain period of time, uh, these memoirs have been somewhat uh, forgotten. So um, our our publishing of this book is trying to uh, examine and, and 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 in some ways really continue this work. So um, while Fremont Older and the journalists at the Bulletin are interviewing and working with 
uh, prisoners, thieves, burglars, murderers, and sex workers trying to understand sort of what are the social conditions that drive people towards criminality and what ought society do with these people, if anything, um, trying to take an approach of understanding and humility. Uh, most of the rest of the country was wrapped up in a sort of white slavery epidemic, uh, attempting to prescribe different approaches to eradicate criminality and sex work from the American landscape. Um, so this white slavery uh, uh, fascination really begins in the American newspapers, uh, actually begins in a, in a UK newspaper in 1885 and immediately influences uh, American journalism. These exposés purported to be based upon either direct interviews or memoirs of the victims of sex trafficking uh, or were written by muckraking journalists who claimed that they had infiltrated the brothels and vice dens of Chicago, New York, San Francisco, other major cities throughout the country. And they were giving the firsthand scoop of the horrors that they had witnessed uh, in these places. It, now, historians today have pretty much outright negated most of the conclusions that these journalists drew. And it's apparent that most of these sort of white slave narratives were entirely fictionalized. Um, but they had an enormous impact on American politics and specifically really impacted members of women's clubs, you know, women who were behind the suffrage movement, who were fighting for female representation in politics in America for the first time. These newspapers in many ways were specifically targeting these sort of white slave exposés to their female readers in order to elicit and inspire these anti-vice and anti-corruption campaigns across the American landscape. Um, and it was successful. You know, media historian Gretchen Soderland attributes the white slave craze in America directly to the propaganda efforts of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which in 1900 was the largest women's organization in America. Uh, the basic narrative of these sort of white slave exposés was um, that white, young white women, generally from rural parts of the country, were being kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery, uh, usually by Jewish pimps or men of color. Uh, and then the profits that were made within these brothels and vice dens were being siphoned into the wallets of corrupt politicians. Um, this narrative, really encapsulated these white American anxieties about the rapidly changing cultural landscape in America during the progressive era. This, this notion of white women being kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery really encapsulated these anxieties about mass urbanization, immigration, particularly from non-white countries or countries that at the time were considered non-white. Uh, Immigrate, uh, yes, yeah, so a racial integration, transforming notions of gender and more and more women working outside of the home for the first time in American history, uh, and these anxieties about civic and political corruption and crime. Uh, now, as you can see from some of these image that, images that I'm sharing here, the white slave movement, this anti-trafficking movement, really co-opted imagery from the anti-slavery abolitionist movement of you know the 1860s and on and in doing so you know even in their even outside of just the imagery that they use but in their rhetoric they ascribe like these white women being kidnapped and enslaved in sexual slavery as being just as bad if not worse as the mass enslavement of african americans in the us and you know, there's a lot of discussion within these white slave narratives about the purity of white women as the basis of Anglo-American superiority, a lot of language about immigrants, particularly Jewish, Chinese, and non-white immigrants, um, importing immorality, importing sex work and immorality into the United States. Um, and this notion also, 
allowed people strategically to ignore the actual instances of sex slavery that were happening across the country, which tended to be the sexual enslavement of non-white women. Um, famously here in San Francisco, there were many Chinese cribs in which Chinese women were sold into actual sex slavery. Um, on the whole, this was not happening to white women. Um, most white women were engaging in sex work because of either economic necessity uh, or a desire for a certain amount of economic freedom that they were not allowed elsewhere. Um, so, you know, historians today have have essentially concluded that these white that this white slave hysteria was precisely that a hysteria and a sensation, no, not based in any way in fact. And even at the time, many of these influential exposés were outed as being falsified. Um, famously, George Kibb Turner's expose, The Daughters of the Poor, which in which he claimed to have infiltrated brothels in New York and stoked a lot of anti-Semitic anxiety by saying that he found all these, you know, conniving Jewish pimps who were trafficking in these women, eventually went into a grand jury investigation and was proven to be entirely falsified. This is in 1909. So already this sort of the validity of the white slave narrative was being questioned um, in America. And yet it had an immense impact on popular opinion. And what's most relevant for us here in looking at Alice's story is that the white traffic narrative indicates a shift in American consciousness where people stopped thinking of sex workers as sinners or fallen women or women without means serving at what they called a necessary but evil function in society. Um, suddenly, Americans started conceiving of sex workers as victims uh, in need of rescue, you know, kidnapping victims. And this narrative really survives today. Uh, it's a torch that's been carried on through anti-trafficking organizations and Hollywood sob stories, and probably one that's familiar to most of us here in the room, if not all of us. Um, and during the progressive era, you know, these, these pri primarily educated middle and upper class um, white women who had for decades claimed their own political power and agency through their charitable work quickly took on anti-vice and anti-trafficking as their cause du jour, um, which, which transformed the American landscape. Um, Alice Smith's story was published during the height of an anti-vice movement here in San Francisco. Uh, though prostitution was already technically illegal in San Francisco, brothels operating in the red light districts of the notorious Barbary Coast and the uptown Tenderloin were tacitly accepted by police, politicians, and the public. Uh, these brothel districts were a mainstay of essentially every town and city in America since time immemorial. They were considered places where boys could be boys and where the sacrifices of some sinful women could protect the virtue of unmarried girls. Um, but, you know, in the context of the rebuilding of the city in the aftermath of the 1906 earthquake and this sort of new era of a progressive reform mindset influenced by eugenics, influenced by sort of technological utopianism and this notion that we can construct an ideal society if we just, you know, build cities in the right way and educate people in the proper ways, et cetera, um, transform the way that people started thinking about brothels. And wealthy San Franciscans really wanted to modernize and move away from the legacies of their boomtown past. Uh, reformers envisioned San Francisco as the imperial center of the West, rising from the ashes of the quake. Um, they wanted a downtown business district that was untainted by the sight of prostitutes, vagrants, um, and other unhoused folks, Chinese laborers, um, sick and disabled beggars, and these reformers believed that law enforcement could do away with these undesirables if enough pressure was put on them. Um, club women and religious leaders generally took a slightly gen had a slightly gentler perspective and really wished to save these unfortunate people. And in order to do so, they took a twofold approach, attacking the dance halls and bars of the Barbary Coast locally and pushing forth statewide legislation aimed at closing all brothels in California. 
Uh, their ide ideal deadline was looming because San Francisco was approved to host the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition, which would bring nearly 15, excuse me, nearly 19 million visitors to San Francisco in 1915. You know, the fantasy of these reformers was really that San Francisco would be a clean modern city um, in the view of, of these visitors once the PPIE took place. So in 1911, California women get the vote and quickly get to work influencing legislation. I do wanna note that of course, not all women were given the vote. You know, Native American women still were not considered citizens, nor were you know, non-Native Chinese born immigrants and other immigrants, but you know, many women were enfranchised in 1911. And very quickly, a women's legislative camp council is formed, which is a federation of various women's club members who start working with the state assembly to draft a red light abatement bill, which aimed at empowering citizens to help enforce prostitution laws. The notion was that anybody who suspected a brothel was in operation essentially could call in a tip and um, the property owners of those buildings, if it was found that prostitution was occurring in that place, uh, the property and all of its contents would be seized. There was also talk of setting up a $50,000 fund to set up essentially a labor camp for the rescued prostitutes. Um, this law was popular in Southern California and with Southern California Congress people and other rural um, Californian Congress members, but it was harder to sell to San Francisco politicians um, who really felt that a private that that vice couldn't just be legislated away, that there were more complicated factors than just a lack of enforcement going on. Um, Mayor James Rolfe, who you know famously rode around in his campaign vehicle with the Madame Tessie Walls, was publicly ambivalent about vice reform and privately hostile to the idea, frankly. Um, he preferred the tactic of segregation and regulation including providing sex workers with regular health checkups in the newly founded municipal clinic um, of 1911. But the women's clubs orchestrated an impressive and relentless political campaign and the bill succeeded in both houses of Congress despite almost no affirmative votes by San Francisco assemblymen and, and senators. Uh, the law was quickly challenged on the grounds of its constitutionality and was placed on the popular ballot to be voted on in the 1914 election, and the club women now had to begin the task of convincing California voters that social purity was in their best interest. Uh, meanwhile, local reformers worked to discourage prostitution in San Francisco by regulating local dance halls and bars. Uh, while some of these dance halls were essentially fronts for prostitution, Many, if not most, were simply dance clubs catering to a burgeoning youth culture and tourist districts. Um, but these white women reformers were anxious about the notion of, of single young women going to dance in places where they might be exposed to liquor, um, single young men, not to mention interracial dancing, cross-dressing and other markers of queer activity that certain, certainly occurred in these dance halls and clubs of the Barbary Coast. The notion was that sort of the splendor of the nightlife as well as booze were the gateway drug to prostitution. Um, and also that white slavers might be staking out in these dance halls just waiting to kidnap vulnerable young women. So in 1912 and 1913, the San Francisco Center of the California Civic League, which later became the League of Women Voters, formed a dance hall commission and proposed legislation which banned dancing in any establishments where liquor was sold, and another law that banned women from working in any saloon or making any profit off of alcohol sales. Uh, the San Francisco Examiner took this on um, as their primary campaign of 1913, really sounding the call for a clean city for clean people, and as you can see, this image um, from 1913 in the Examiner of the city of San Francisco drowning the rat of commercialized vice in a bucket of water of the campaign for civic decency. Um, this was really sort of what the daily headlines on the Examiner look like in this period. And we actually have a, read a letter that was written to Mayor Rolfe by one of these dance hall workers saying, 
please, like I'm pleading with you not to allow the enforcement of these laws. Like I'm just a woman trying to earn a living wage. I'm not a rat, you know, in a cage to be drowned. Um, obviously specifically referring to this image that she had seen in the examiner. But these laws did pass, uh, once again, thanks to the impressive efforts of the local women's clubs. But in response, you know, the, the ultimate uh, uh, consequence of this was that over 500 women who had been employed as bartenders, waitresses, and dancers in these clubs were suddenly left without work. Um, the San Francisco Civic League did try to open a relief bureau in the local YWCA, attempting to do outreach and offer char offering charity and jobs to these so-called dance hall girls who were now out of work. But these reformers were met with cold, hard stares and resentment. Very few of these women would actually talk to them. And those who would made it clear, like you've taken away my only option for gainful employment. Like, why am I supposed to trust you? What are you offering me in exchange? The jobs that were being offered to these women often only paid about $6 a week, um, which even the US Department of Labor admitted was below a necessary subsistence wage of at least $9 a week. These dance hall women had been making up to $7 a night on average in these clubs. And what the reformers of the San Francisco Civic League didn't totally understand was that, you know, many of these women were mothers or had sick or infirm family members to take care of. And these $6 a week jobs just weren't going to cut it. Um, these reformers also tended to assume that all women must have fathers, brothers, husbands, some man in their life who would be helping to support them financially. But of course, this simply was not the reality for many poor young women who found themselves employed in the brothels and dance halls of the Barbary Coast. So despite these failures to reform the dance hall workers, uh, San Francisco reformers on the whole found these new dance hall regulations to be a success and doubled down their efforts to pass this red light abatement law. It is in the context of the debates around red light abatement that the bulletin decides to publish Alice. Uh, older, female Older was actually an early supporter of red light abatement, but in this vein of him, you know, working alongside prisoners and ex-convicts, he becomes confronted by his own blind spots and prejudices. In line with his approach to prison reform, he came upon the idea that he didn't actually understand why prostitution existed or how this law might impact the workers themselves. We still don't know exactly how he was introduced to Alice Smith, but we have a couple of theories. We know that a number of sex workers wrote into the paper during the publication of Donald Lowry's My Life in Prison. It seems that word had gotten out about the mutual aid work being done by Older and his friends. Some women wrote in asking for charity or help seeking above board employment. Some wrote in just to thank the paper for the honest and sympathetic portrayal of criminals and prisoners. We also know that Donald Lowry was friends with many local sex workers. Perhaps he introduced Alice Smith to Freema Older like he did Jack Black. However the introduction happened, it certainly impacted Older's politics and perspective. Uh, reporter R.L. Duffus recalls watching Fremont Older openly weeping in the offices of the paper after an early meeting with Alice. So from what we can tell, her story had quite an impact on the readers. Um, so what what really makes Alice's story different from the other white slave narratives that were so popular in America at the time? Ultimately, her story begins very similarly to a number of these white slave, slave stories. She's a Midwestern girl who is uneducated, comes from a poor family, and decides to move out west to the big city. Um, to make money so that she can send more cash back home to her to her impoverished family. She is essentially abandoned by the family who had promised to take her in uh, on the West Coast and has to make her own way in the world. And this is where her story starts to subtly and then fairly radically shift from these white slave narratives. She's never, you know, tempted or kidnapped by a pimp. She isn't lured by the magic and splendor of the nightlife. Um, you know, she isn't drawn into sex work because of 
uh, any one sexual assault. Um, and yet she does suffer, uh, she, she suffers extreme sexual, um, I mean, she does suffer from certain sexual assaults by various employers over the course of her time trying to make an honest wage. She uh, faces immense gender discrimination in her attempts to find decently paying work. And eventually sex work is the only option that makes sense and allows her to feed herself. Um, you know, prior to ending up in sex work, she has so many different jobs, it's difficult to even count. She works as a domestic servant, as an apple picker in an orchard. She works as a laundress, as a nanny. Um, and here's one of her descriptions of her attempt to make a living off of the $2 a week offered her by the uh, laundry where she gets employment. Six dollars. Oh, wait. I went back to my new two dollar room, turned on the light, sat down on the hard bed, and figured things out. I had a sort of feeling as if I was hanging by a thin rope over a volcano. Six dollars a week, take out two for room rent, that left four a week for eating, clothes, car fare, washing, and a good time. Cut out car fare, cut out clothes for the present. My old shoes would just have to do. Cut out washing. I do it myself in my room. Cut out. Yes, cut out the good time. I'd need that $4 a week just for eating. Divide that by seven. That meant 60 cents a day, 10 cents for breakfast, 20 for lunch, 30 for supper. That would make 420 a week. I'd be 20 cents short. Well, maybe Sundays I'd go without eating, only 20 cents work. Or maybe, and this is where she begins to consider sex work as a possible option for her. She later in her memoir, you know, her memoir isn't explicitly political necessarily. She doesn't have an easily formulated um, perspective on Red Light Abatement Act or any of these laws. It really is just, um, it seems that she was really attempting to just humanize herself and be seen as human by the readers of the paper. Um, there's this one moment where she says, evidently a prostitute was one who sold herself for money. Well, I wondered, was there anybody in the world, according to that, who didn't sell herself or himself for money? Didn't everybody supply some demand in some more or less disagreeable way? And wasn't everything always for money? So her story, you know, does take these sort of radical departures from the white slave perspective. And, and the bulletin felt a need to cover themselves and protect themselves from possible censorship under the Comstock laws, for instance. Um, as you can see possibly here on the slide, uh, just underneath the announcement of this opening installment of, of Alice Smith's story, it says the following chapter of A Voice from the Underworld has been read and approved by um, a committee of club women. And they did. Fremont Older enlisted the help of local club women, including some of the members um, like Jane Mrs. James Ellis Tucker, who was the president of the San Francisco Center of the California Civic League, to read and approve of these daily installments to show this isn't just, you know, some lurid sensational um, or inappropriate piece to be publishing in our papers. Um, and yet this didn't ultimately protect the paper from backlash and censorship. Um, I will say, I think for Devin and I, you know, Alice's story is incredibly remarkable, but one of the most critical things about this document are these letters that were written into the paper. Um, like I said, 114 were published by self-proclaimed sex workers, and we were only allowed, able to include 12 of these letters in our book, but we do hope eventually to transcribe and publish the whole of these because it's just an incredible, incredible treasure, treasure trove of the sort of cross section of opinions of people on these questions about gender, sexuality, vice. Um, many of the sex workers who wrote into the paper expressed feelings of being trapped in sex work with no other options. Um, some begged for charitable assistance uh, or above board employment. Others lambasted progressive reformers for their hubris and simply asked to be given a red light district and left alone. Some of these writers called for a revolutionary workers' state. Others blamed male sexuality and suggested that all rapists be castrated. 
Some of these women had been molested or coerced by lovers and pimps, but many others entered the life on their own volition. A number of them describe having children or sick and disabled family members to care for. And what really becomes obvious in reading through these letters is that then, as well as today, you know, sex workers are not a monolith. Um, and these sort of notions of them being either victims or sort of fallen or irredeemable women uh, was a vast oversimplification. Um, generally, the common denominators amongst these women were poverty and gender discrimination. Um, so I just quickly want to read through a couple bits of these letters before we move on. Um, and I know that we're hoping to wrap up fairly soon, but I think that these perspectives are just quite rich. Okay, so one woman who wrote into the bulletin said, it has been my sad experience that a working woman dependent upon herself cannot compete with girls living at home and also married women. They work for low wages and can afford to do so, but a woman alone in the world forced to work for the same wages cannot exist, even though a member of the Women's Political League considers $6 a week an ample wage. It's easy enough for members of women's clubs to suggest such a life on a mere pittance, but to put themselves in such a position, I hardly think they would find their advice practical as I have tried it. Uh, another letter writer said, society women say they will help us and that we must reform, but I don't want sympathy or a helping hand out of this life. All I want is a living wage and I will get out of it myself. Bessie C., an ex-prostitute who wrote in, said, remember, my dear good woman and religious people who pray for all sinners, that prayers, patronage, and pity have never reformed a prostitute or convict, only love and a fighting chance to be on the square. So um, what have we learned about Alice since, since discovering her story and, and publishing it? as uh, the book that we did in 2016. Uh, yeah, I just want to quickly, um, we're kind of running out of time, but I want to quickly talk about a couple of questions and some of this research. We actually done quite a lot of research since the book was published. When we published the book, we didn't know uh, who Alice Smith was. It was obviously not her real name, uh, nor was it her name necessarily uh, on her work name. Um, and this question of veracity and a question of anonymity is uh, something that we learned through our research, um, both co with contemporary sources and with the history. Uh, anonymity is a tool of survival, an absolutely necessary thing for sex workers throughout history. And uh, we felt like we were kind of approaching some uncomfortable ground about trying to find this person who every single thing we, we as we did this research, pointed towards her not her identity not being wanted to be uh, to be known publicly. Uh, we do know who she is. We know quite a lot about her now, but we've decided not to, uh, at least at this point, um, not to not to release her name. But I feel like we could still talk about her and, and some of the things that we've learned. Um, the 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 sort of um, the breaking point that that where we where we really discovered uh, who she was came. We were doing some cleanup research for our talk for our book release at the California Historical Society. We went back to that Bancroft and we actually found a letter that was uh, considerably later than the period that we'd been looking at uh, that, that we hadn't noticed. And it was from the ghostwriter of the piece who was interested in possibly turning this into a book just months after the, um, the Great Depression hit in 1929. And he asked Fremont Older if they could find Alice Smith and then get her permission for a book. And Fremont Older said he, that he couldn't find her, that he'd seen her within a year, he'd try to find her, but he didn't know. Nothing came of this. Uh, and the name that the ghostwriter used is her work name, and which was Mabel P. And so her work name being uh, something that they knew already turned us on to the idea that they that her 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 true name wasn't known to the staff and we don't know if it was even known by Fremont Older although we, we guessed that it possibly was um, but what we found written you know in Ivy found this with her eagle eye written in this tiny tiny pencil right in the margins was a name and it seemed like well perhaps this was a name that they were looking for and it turned out to be a the name of a married woman 
we traced this and looked through it. Uh, and luckily, she was married in San Francisco. She could have been married everywhere, anywhere. But we uh, we spent many, many, many hours, many days going through City Hall's marriage records. We didn't have a year. We had to go through several years, just like we didn't know when the, the memoir was published, having to go through that. And we finally found her marriage certificate. And thus, we also got her death certificate, and we learned a great deal about her. Now, uh, often poor women from, in the memoir, she says she's from Illinois. It turns out that she's actually from Indiana. Um, if you're from a city and you're a poor woman, the chance of being found in the records, other than census records, things like this, uh, usually is quite small. You can't really find much out. She's from a small town, and this was like this Rosetta Stone. It was incredible. Her local paper wrote about everything that happened, every single little thing. Yeah, the, the, the beginning of the memoir goes through the social world of the small town, and a lot of it is calling. And a lot of it is with her boyfriend, Billy, who is named John, actually. So in the memoir, we have her and John going and meeting various people. Uh, we have exact dates. Um, in her, we find out this is a, actually a, a photograph from the county that she's from in 1900. Um, we find out that um, uh, that her her uncle Ed, which is a, a character in the book, is actually named Uncle Ed in real life. Um, we find out that her grandfather actually becomes paralyzed, and she has to go to Spokane, Washington, which is Westville, in um, in in her memoir. Which the paper wanted it to be a Bay Area story, so it led us to believe that it was Oakland, California. In our book, we say it's Oakland, but we found out that it was actually Spokane, Washington. Uh, in the paper, it says that her grandmother and sister from Spokane um, on her paternal side comes out and takes her out because her maternal family can't take care of her anymore in Indiana. And she goes to Spokane. Um, her sister works at the Westerner from Westville. The Westerner is a telephone exchange. We find out that in Spokane, she worked for the spokesman of Spokane, uh, one of our friends up in the archives there made that point saying that that seems to be an internal joke that they have within the memoir. Um, we also find out that um, in 1907, that there was a social cleanup act by a sheriff, Ren Rice, in Spokane. And this is when it appears that she leaves. Um, in the memoir, she goes to a town called Zephyr, where she works in brothel. And we actually haven't found what Zephyr would be. Um, we have, uh, in the memoir, she then goes to Canada. She's introduced uh, as a madam to go to Canada. She goes to Canada. We actually have a letter she writes into her hometown paper from Canada in 1908, and she says that she's homesick, and she wishes that she could get the, the paper in Canada. Uh, she then says that she tries to go back home to Indiana to try to see if she's accepted. Um, and she finds that she is not accepted. Um, and we find this in the paper. Once again, she says she's visiting from San Francisco in 1910. The census that we find in 1910, she's living in the Uptown Tender One, another vice district like the Barbary Coast, as a masseuse on O'Farrell Street. Um, she then goes back to Indiana. She tells, she says that she doesn't want to be in San Francisco when a voice from the underworld is running. She actually goes back to Indiana to be with her family while that's running. Um, so this became really fascinating. Uh, another thing that we found out, sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to make a note that when we found out that her story was really centered in Spokane, um, more so than it was here in the Bay Area, we went up to Spokane and worked with uh, archivists there who helped us trace uh, her entire family history there in the city. And this image that we're showing here on the screen of a saloon from 1905, is was fatefully an image of the building in which we were able to trace the address in which we was, she was living uh, at that exact time. So one of these sort of four apartment windows that you see on the top floor is where she would have been working and or living and perhaps even working. And this letter that we're showing here is an is a tangentially related document where we found um, these series of letters written by a Spokane sex worker from 1905 who is not Alice Smith, but whose personal recollections of uh, her time engaging in sex work were you know, incredibly illuminating for us. Um, yeah, and, and what became really interesting that we also found is that um, 
that that the that the the memoir was ended early, and that uh, it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, sorry if anyone hasn't read the book or if you're wanting to read the book. But in the end, uh, she gets out of sex work with her sister, and what we found is that wasn't actually the case. Um, the postmaster general Albert Burson, Burson at the time, who was this massive reactionary who stopped the publication or being able to send through the mail uh, works by um, Max Eastman, the, 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 the communist uh, organizer, uh, Emma Goldman. Uh, he uh, loved attacking newspapers or any or print that goes through, goes through, um, to, through the post. And essentially there was a campaign both by club women and by these sort of men's men's rights groups, these men's clubs. Uh, on the one hand, there is this, they, that a voice from the underworld uh, club women uh, were concerned that it was not, um, that it was deviating from their political platform. And then on the other hand, you had these kind of men's clubs that don't want the Barbary Coast to be shut down. They don't want the vice districts to be shut down. And they don't want these stories about uh, labor and about women struggling uh, to come out either. And uh, it seems like these things collided and uh, this postmaster stepped in and told them that the, that the bulletin would not be allowed to be used. Um, sent through the mail, which would, you know, shut down the paper if the memoir was to continue. So they wrapped it up really quickly. And uh, a month after it's wrapped up, Alice Smith was arrested in a brothel. So we know that she actually was continuing sex work after the wrap up of this and Freeman Older bailed her out. We uh, then in 1914 have her in Woodhills where she uh, is seen smoking a cigarette and Freeman Older and his wife Cora um, uh, it's, it, this is actually from Cora Older's diaries, which are very, very difficult to read, unfortunately. Um, they're all handwritten, they're at the Bancroft Library. But uh, she says that their little adopted daughter laughed because Al Smith was the first woman they, she ever saw smoking a cigarette. Um, I kind of want to finish this here with a letter we found in 1935, the only actual piece that we have of Alice Smith uh, signed in her true maiden name. Um, and it was written in 1935 after Fremont Older died. She sent it a condolence letter to Cora Older. And she actually uses a, some terminology of this piece of, of flotsam, of, of driftwood, that is a common motif that goes throughout A Voice from the Underworld. And it's quite a beautiful short letter. And I'd like to read it. Dear Mrs. Older, just heard an announcement over the radio. May God be with and comfort you now in the remainder of the lonely way. And may he also be with the many bewildered, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. And may he also be with the many bewildered bits of driftwood whose burdens were lightened by Mr. Older's patience, tolerance, and kind understanding. I am sure we are all better men and women because of knowing him. You will receive many messages of condolence. None of them will be written on cheap stationery or as badly composed as this one, yet none of them will be more sincere. Neither will they touch upon the dearest thing to a woman's heart, the loss of her husband. Mr. Older often spoke of his love for you, and when he would say, Cora, my wife, one couldn't help noticing a faint caress in his deep voice. All of us in the old oak will miss him, signed with her name. So in brief conclusion, you know, what happened after the end of A Voice from the Underworld? Well, uh, the red light abatement passes and the first target of these reformers were a Chinese brothel. Uh, the bill quickly gets tied up in courts, um, but by 1917, uh, due to America entering, you know, World War I and enhancing the war effort, there becomes a immense amount of federal pressure to shut down uh, America's vice districts surrounding the ports and military centers. So um, the Presidio ends up playing a part in this story uh, because the U.S. Commission on War Training Camp Activities specifically directed the San Francisco Center to police the area surrounding the Presidio and to make it illegal for uh, prostitutes to ply their trade within five miles of the Presidio, which of course 
since we live in a seven by seven city, uh, city um, which was considerably less developed at that time, that pretty much uh, illegalizes, increases the enhancement of enforcing prostitution law throughout San Francisco. Um, correspondingly, in 1917, this rabble rousing reverend named Paul Smith, whose Methodist church was in the center of the uptown Tenderloin Vice District, makes a big enough stink uh, about the prostitutes who are applying their trade openly outside of his church, um, that Mayor Rolf and the police commission finally do announce the closure of the Barbary Coast. Um, it's announced on January 24th that they're going to close all of the brothels of the Barbary Coast on Valentine's Day uh, in sort of a cruel twist of fate. Um, so the night that this is announced, these two madams Mar Maud Spencer and Reggie Gamble actually contact, of all people, Freema Older, the editor of the Bulletin, asking him to help them get out the word about this protest they're organizing outside of the church the following morning. And Freema Older says in his biography, you know, I gained these women's trust over the course of publishing Alice Smith's memoir, and they knew I'd be available to help them. And so they organized this protest uh, that takes place the following morning. Uh, as you can see here is the front page of the bulletin reporting on this protest. Um, this is actually one of the lower numbers you see is that 200 women showed up. Some of the other newspapers reported that anywhere between three and 400 women showed up to this action. And essentially they filled the church. Um, one of the madams walked up to the pulpit and you know, sort of kicked Paul, Reverend Paul Smith out of his position and openly confronted him about, you want us out of your city, you want us gone, but what do you expect us to do? Um, there aren't any paying jobs for women like us. And if you just kick us out of your city, we're just gonna have to go to another city. And that doesn't transform anything about our lives except making our conditions much harder. Um, the Reverend Paul Smith sort of capitulates and says that, you know, he agrees and he understands and he wishes that things were better for women, but that he has limited power and yada da. And eventually, yes, on Valentine's Day 1917, um, a mass eviction takes place in the Barbary Coast and 1400 women and sex workers in one day are pushed out onto the streets. Um, once again, the women's club sort of set up a relief station but they report that only one of these women approached them asking for help, uh, essentially asking for money to buy a ticket to, to go home. Um, as we all know, you know, prostitution didn't end in San Francisco because of this. Uh, it simply transformed the conditions in which people needed to apply their trade. And frankly, from what historians can tell, and as well as contemporary sex workers, it simply Instead of women being able to work within the confines of the brothels in which they had a certain amount of safety from police abuses, um, from being robbed, from being violently attacked, suddenly they were forced to apply their trade on the streets and in underground conditions which were much less safe and which put them at risk of police abuse, um, which includes rape and physical violence uh, quite frequently even still today. Uh, as well as abuse by, by clients. Um, this is where you see the system of pimping really arise in America. So the impact of these women's groups who are really trying to protect women from corrupt pimps actually ends up sending them into the hands of pimps. Um, but we have this moment of this protest in 1917, which as of today appears to have been the first sex worker organized protest in American history. And here in San Francisco, we have a long legacy and continuing legacy of sex workers organizing uh, for their rights, for their dignity, um, and for decriminalization, essentially not to be criminalized for the choices that they've had to make with their own bodies in order to make a buck. So with that, um, we would love to get some questions from you all. Thank you for sitting with us for the last nearly hour and a half. Um, we hope that you've taken away some interesting information and perspective on the history of this city. And we look forward to answering any questions you may have. And I think questions can take place uh, either in the chat or you can use the raised hand feature 
in the meantime, I can show a couple more photos of some ephemera we've gathered uh, from the later sex workers' rights movement beginning in the 1970s in San Francisco. We have here a pin from Coyote, uh, an organization of sex workers called Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, um, who advocated for the decriminalization of sex work and began a sort of mutual aid organization in the uh, tradition of Donald Lowry's mutual aid organization for ex-prisoners um, in order to provide health and financial resources for sex workers, which today still exists in San Francisco as St. James Infirmary, uh, the first sex worker peer-based mutual aid organization. Um, and on the left, you see a photo of Carol Lee, the local activist still living with us today with her fabulous costume and decriminalized prostitution sign. Um, she is the woman who coined the term sex work and who has helped um, people conceptual conceive of prostitution as a labor choice as opposed to a sin. Okay, I see a question from Robert Cherney, yes. It's, it's uh, really a compliment. Um, uh, I, I think that you really covered a great deal of ground and uh, have done some very impressive research. So congratulations on that. One thing that might also be of interest, in, and I'm sure you know about this, but may have just not had time to mention it, was that before the Red Light Abatement Act went into effect and the brothels were closed, uh, the city public health department had uh, made, was available to these sex workers mm -hmm. for them to have regular checkups to determine if they had contracted a, a disease. And of course, mm -hmm. that came to an end at the same time that they were forced out to work on the streets. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. We um are fascinated with this legacy of Julius Rosenstern, the doctor who founded San Francisco's Municipal Clinic in 1911, which was specifically a health clinic designed um, to service sex workers. Now, you know, Rosenstern was a pragmatist who similarly didn't believe that you could legislate vice away and felt that society really needed to do whatever they could to mitigate sort of the, um, consequences of sex work, which at the time, without modern prophylactics, et cetera, venereal disease was a concern for many people, which um, was a reality. And it was also a reality that was uh, sort of blown up in public consciousness by, you know, eugenesis. Um, and the municipal clinic, yeah, it served this incredible function of of providing regular health checkups for the city's sex workers. Although it was also somewhat controversial amongst the city's sex workers because essentially what would happen, you would have to go to the clinic once a week or so, and you would have a sort of little passport book where you get it stamped off your, you know, your seal of approval if you were deemed healthy. And if you had that stamp of approval, um, you know, the police couldn't arrest you uh, essentially. But if you didn't have that stamp, you could be sent away to jail or prison. Now, the complicated thing was there appears to have been a simultaneous effort where if you were deemed diseased, your photo would be taken and hung in the Hall of Justice, which for many sex workers, um, you know, ended up outing them and essentially impacting their ability to find or maintain employment outside of sex work, which many sex workers, that's not their only job. They sort of use it to supplement their income. Um, you know, and, and it was a it was a means of, of publicly shaming these people. And so, you know, I think at the time, the municipal clinic was an incredibly radical idea. Um, and also it has its own problematic legacies um, where I wouldn't necessarily advocate for that exact same thing to come back again today as a means of, of dealing with sex work. Um, but yeah, certainly was a radical departure from some of the other sort of progressive reform um, modes of dealing with, with sex work. I also just wanted to add um, that Professor Cherney, uh, we thank in the book because a lot of this original research was um, 
under his tutelage before we knew that it was going to be a book. And so we can't really <laughs> express uh, more thanks than, you know, uh, than possible for it. It's, it's really so thank you once again, uh, Professor. Oh, I just pulled up this last photo in our presentation, which is of an action that took place on January 25th, 2017. Um, to sort of celebrate the 100 year anniversary of this first sex worker rights protest uh, that happened here in San Francisco. And this is a collective of, of individuals, sex workers and their allies and us included, um, marching to the original site from the Tenderloin Museum to the original site of Reverend Paul Smith's Methodist Church where this protest took place. Um, and at that site, we had sort of historical, um, many of the people who have really led uh, the sex worker rights movement here in San Francisco since the 60s, including Carol Lee, um, read and recite, you know, the actual protest speech that was given on that day 100 years ago. Um, so that was a pretty fascinating event to get to participate in. Um, are there any other questions? All right. If not, then yeah. I suppose we can wrap up. If there are no other questions, we still have a few more minutes. Uh, I think we can wrap things up at 4.30 if there are any more questions that anyone would like to ask. But of course, we just want to thank Devin and Ivy for joining us today and for letting us into this world and for publishing their book and taking inspiration from Professor Cherney and all of it. It's been a really incredible point of view to get of San Francisco and during an era that we care about so much and we want to bring more attention back to those early years and you know the Presidio itself is such a you know it's a little cornerstone of this story and especially with the military um, vector and it's just really interesting to hear how that happened. Yes. Yeah, thank you. We definitely, we definitely think the um, progressive era is a timely era to study because there are just so many uh, similar threads to the politics of our particular time today. Um, and from our perspective, we're sort of living through a new, renewed anti-vice movement here in San Francisco today with, um, you know, the recall campaign against the district attorney, Chisa Boudin, which really harkens back to all these recall campaigns of the progressive era due to what's considered to be, you know, his stance of not being tough enough on crime, um, as well as a lot of neighborhood organizations such as the Central Mission Neighbors and others organizing to increase police presences in San Francisco neighborhoods to attempt to eradicate prostitution and homelessness. Um, there are just so many intellectual and political threads that tie directly back to this era. So it's been such a pleasure for us to look at the progressive era and really uh, try to wrap our heads around sort of the roots of these philosophies. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Samantha, for organizing this for us. Thank you for joining us. You know, it's been a wonderful talk. And I think everyone here has learned so much. And I hope that they all, anyone who hasn't yet, picks up a copy of Alice from their nearest independent bookseller. Yes, and actually the um, audiobook version was just released two weeks ago. So you can now listen to Alice Smith's story if that's your preferred way of consuming media. That's wonderful. Did you guys read it or do you have- We also have a- No, it's a, um, there's an audiobook company. Um, it's it's out on Audible and Amazon uh, that, that bought the rights to it and it's a professional uh, audiobook reader that she sounds wonderful. Um, we also have a website that has some additional information and that you can contact us with. Um, yeah, voicesfromtheunderworld.com is where you can read some, a few more of the letters that we weren't able to publish in our blog and, and get a little additional context and, and also contact us. Yeah, if, you, if there's any questions that come up, if anyone's interested, uh, and for further dialogue, um, yeah, voices from the underworld.com. And just to wrap our local library, the SFPL has a number of copies of our book and should be um, putting the audio, making the audio book available um, 
via CD and uh, downloadable MP3 soon as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us and for all of our participants, you know, definitely continue to keep up with Ivy and Devin and their work and check out that website and also to continue um, PHA being able to bring in wonderful speakers like Ivy and Devin and continue, you know, funding and trying to explore this era in history, uh, please check us out at pha-sf.org and become a member or give us a little contribution. Every little bit helps. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Bye. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.